today. Our speaker is uh, Catherine Neck. Um, she's uh, currently at the California Institute of Technology. You might have heard of that institution. Uh, so, um, so she got her PhD at uh, MIT, another institution you may have heard of. Uh, and she, uh, but apparently there was no one interesting enough for her to work with at MIT. So she got her PhD with Matt Holman, uh, doing planetary science. Uh, uh, Matt Holman works at uh, Harvard CFA. <coughs> Um, so, right, so her research interest, she's worked on Kepler, she's broadly interested in dynamics of planetary systems, she's a theorist who kind of you know, guides the observers to make sure that they're uh, not going astray. Um, so, uh, so she's currently a the fellow for at the Center for Planetary Science, so kind of a planetary astronomy at Caltech, okay, so, um, and she will be talking today about the dynamics of evolving planetary systems, so it's not very interesting. Hey, well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about work that I've done uh, with Eric Nagel and also with Constantine Tegan on planetary systems. Uh, and the work relates to the very broad question of how planetary systems form and evolve into the systems that we see today. And what I'm going to be emphasizing uh, in this talk is the role that dynamics plays uh, in, these, um, in these processes. To begin with, though, I'd like to um, talk about the solar system a little bit. So the solar system has a number of distinctive features which collectively we refer to as the orbital architecture of the system. So these are things like the fact that there are only gas giants and ice giants further out in the system and closer in towards the sun there are terrestrial planets. And there's also no planets interior to Mercury with a period of 88 days. Um, another feature of the solar system is the dynamically cold nature of the orbits. So all of the planets nearly share a common orbital plane. Um, and that orbital plane is also aligned with the equator of the sun. So that means that the angular momentum, the spinning momentum of the sun is lined up with the orbital angular momentum of the planets. Um, additionally, the orbits of the planets are nearly circular. So that is why we would say then that the solar system is a dynamically cold system today. Um, now 20 to 25 years ago, the solar system was the only planetary system that we knew of orbiting a main sequence star. And so it was impossible for us to tell uh, whether or not these features would be unique or if they'd be ubiquitous. Um, and it was impossible for us to test theories of why these features um, could, have, could have arisen. Um, but now, after you know, 25 years of exoplanet observational work and theoretical work, um, we can actually start to put the solar system into a larger context um, and to get a, an idea of how diverse planetary systems can be. And so one of the first things that we have learned, or one of the major things that we've learned, is that exoplanet systems are extremely diverse. We know that systems can occur very far from their host stars like the HR8799 system. This is a system of four planets, and they're all uh, about a Jupiter mass or larger, um, and they also orbit uh, relative to their star um, at much larger orbital distances, so it tends to up to 70 AU. Um, this is a directly imaged system, so what you're seeing is actually thermal emission uh, from the planets after light from the star has been blocked out. Um, we know that systems can also be found very close to their host star. Um, a particular striking example is the KY500 system, which has five planets. Their sizes, I don't know if you can quite read this, uh, range from a diameter of 1.3 Earth radii up to 2.6. Um, and all the orbital periods are less than 10 days. So there's a lot of mass of planets very, very close to the coast star. And so just for perspective, these are the orbits of Y for KY500. Here's Mercury, Venus, and the Earth. Uh, we know that planetary systems can be misaligned uh, with respect to their host star spin. So Kepler-56 is one uh, really interesting example. It has two gas giants which share a common orbital plane, but that orbital plane is misaligned from the stellar uh, equatorial plane. Uh, we also know that planets can have very dynamically excited orbits in another sense, um, in terms of their eccentricity. So here I'm showing the orbital eccentricity of planets as a function of their orbital period. So these are planets with masses larger than a fifth of the mass of Jupiter. Um, the different colors on this plot just denote uh, whether or not these planets have known planetary companions or not. Um, but what I want you to take away from this is that this distribution of eccentricities is very broad, ranging from, uh, from circular all the way up to essentially parabolic orbit. Um, another way to underscore the diversity of the planets that we've found is on a plot of planet mass and Jupiter masses and orbital separation from their host star. So both of these axes span many orders of magnitude, and what you can see is that we found planets essentially across the entire range where our detection methods allow us to. So that's just neglecting this area down here, where the signal is very small, or the time scale for the um, for the orbits is very long compared to our observational baseline. Um, 
So although there are, are a whole host of observational biases <coughs> in this plot, because a whole host of different detection methods have been used to find these planets, we can identify some rough categories. So there are massive planets at large orbital distances, like I spoke of earlier. Um, these are sort of starting to bridge the gap between planets and brown dwarfs. Um, and how they form, whether they form more like a star or more like a planet is actually um, extremely, it's a, open, a question of open space. Um, there are things which are more reminiscent of Jupiter and the gas giants in our own solar system. So, um, so Jupiter mass planets at more intermediate distances from their host star. Uh, something like 11% of sun-like stars have a giant planet with a semi-dry atmosphere less than 5 AU. That's coming from radial velocity work. There's this population of Jupiter mass planets in a very short orbital separation, uh, in a very short orbital period of a few days. These are what are referred to as hot Jupiters, um, but comparatively, compared to the sort of normal Jupiters, they're uh, much less common. They're only found around 1% of stars like the Sun. And then finally, there's this group of smaller planets that are intermediate in size between Earth and Neptune, um, which have short orbital periods, so and small orbital separations, so orbital periods of 10 to maybe hundreds of days. Um, and this, an example of a system like this would be the KRI 500 system that I mentioned earlier. And actually in this talk, I'm really going to be focusing on these small systems of small planets orbiting close to our host star. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about, about them now. Um, most of them were found by the Kepler telescope, so I'll refer to them uh, loosely as Kepler systems. Um, so Kepler, um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, was designed to look for planets transiting in their host star, and it did so by staring at the same patch of the sky for over four years, or for nearly four years, um, looking for the tiny bits of light you get when a planet transits its host star. Uh, Kepler was extremely successful. It found something like 5,000 planet candidates, the majority of which are real. Um, and what's interesting if you're a uh, fan of dynamics is that over half of them, or roughly half of them, are part of multi-planet systems, uh, some of which are shown here where you can see uh, the multi-planet systems have a full range, so this is all two scale, so they can be found very close to their host star and also at larger orbital distances. Um, based on the statistics from Kepler and also from radio velocity surveys, which have looked for the same population, we know that these planets are very common. So half of stars like the Sun have a small planet, so where small means intermediate size between Earth and Neptune, uh, with an orbital period less than 85 days. And this rate is even higher for stars that are less massive than so the average number of stars per planet around an m dwarf is actually two planets per star. Um, so what that means is that this population of small planets orbiting close to their host stars reflects a very common outcome of planet formation. <coughs> and because of that, it's really worth spending a lot of time trying to understand this population and how they have formed and evolved. Um, and in particular, to use that knowledge that hopefully we'll gain to try and understand why the solar system doesn't have a small planet um, necessarily within this range, um, although it, it's possible that the solar system is just um, sort of on the tail end of the distribution with planets out here that are small, which Kepler just didn't quite get to. Okay, but in general, the takeaway that I want you to have is that planets are common and they're very diverse. So what we'd like to do is take these observations to learn about planetary formation and evolution. And so it's important to realize that um, after planets form, so they form at some place in a disk out of some material, um, but there is a whole host of dynamical processes that can act to shape planets um, and shape their orbits into the systems that we see today. Most of the systems that we've observed um, orbit stars that are around a billion years old or older. And so uh, basically there are a, a number of processes that act on time scales intermediate between the formation time scale and the ages of the systems that we're seeing. Right, and so we'd like to understand how much of the diversity of what we're seeing is due to these dynamical processes. So for example, um, there is the actual formation of planets in the first place, where you have the dynamics of creating smaller bodies to form bigger and bigger uh, cores, and then those cores create gas, and can uh, explain some of the, the different types of planets that we see and where they are, uh, where they're found. There's also the dynamics of how planets interact with the gaseous disk. So once the planets themselves form, they're still embedded in leftover material, and interactions with that leftover material can lead to large-scale variations, or uh, deviations in the semi-major axes and eccentricities, uh, which then um, might also affect what we see today. So the, the, the takeaway there is that um, where planets form originally is not necessarily where we see them today. Um, another process which I'm really interested in but I'm not going to be able to talk about today uh, is orbital instability and chaos, where um, you can start with a system that looks very quiescent after formation, but on longer timescales, instability can set in and planet scattering can occur 
which leads to very dynamically excited orbits um, that, again, are not necessarily reflective of the initial conditions that formed. Uh, finally, if you're going to talk about close-in planets, you also need to worry about things like tidal evolution with the host star um, or atmospheric mass loss of uh, smaller planets. Okay, today though, I'm actually going to start not by discussing these dynamical processes, but instead to be talking about work that I've done using orbital dynamics of planets to characterize them, and in particular to characterize these Kepler systems. Um, because, of course, to test any theories we have about which, about how these systems form and evolve, we need to have a well-characterized sample to begin with. Um, and then the second part of my talk, I'll return to this question of how planetary orbits might evolve in time. And in particular, I'm going to be discussing um, how planets interact with disks and what observational um, consequences that arise because of interactions with the disk to try and assess how important this is for the Kepler systems. Okay, but we're going to start with characterizing planets. So, as I mentioned, Kepler found planets using the transit technique. Now, what that tells you is the planet size and the orbital period and the phase of the planet in its orbit. But really, what we want to know is also the mass of these planets, so we can learn what their densities are, um, learn something about what they're made out of, whether or not they have atmospheres, and so on, to try and understand how they form. And we also want to know what their eccentricities are, um, their mutual inclinations, to study past dynamical uh, excitation, for example. And so the typical method that you would use to get that information is the radio velocity technique. Um, unfortunately, though, the planets that we're talking about, these small planets, um, orbiting uh, preferentially faint stars, because most of the Kepler stars are faint, these are just out of the range of the uh, radio velocity method. And so because of that, there's only something like 50 small planets with radio velocity mass constraints. Uh, this number's not really gonna get higher, uh, sorry, these are planets in the Kepler data sample. And really this is sort of the radio velocity work that's been done for small planets with Kepler that's not gonna increase but the number of small planets with math measurements is not going to increase. Um, and furthermore, it's so hard just to measure that a planet's there and measure its mass, you're not going to be measuring the higher order corrections like eccentricities. Um, so um, sort of at base then, it seems like the Kepler was wonderfully successful at detecting planets, um, but it's leaving us with a population that's not very well characterized. Well, what, why isn't that going to increase yet? Um, just because of this group targeted the brightest stars that would have the biggest sig signals. Oh, just with like modern facilities. Yeah, with modern, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, they went after the ones that they could get, basically. Um, okay, so to make headway then and to actually characterize this population, we actually, the work that I've done has drawn inspiration from uh, our solar system. So the basic idea is that Leverrier and Adams um, basically were monitoring Uranus in the sky, and they saw that its orbit deviated from what they would expect based on interactions with the sun and the other known planets at the time. And so what they inferred was the presence of another massive planet exterior to Uranus, and that was Neptune. And so they basically predicted where Neptune would be in its orbit, and then Gaul observed Neptune essentially exactly where they said it would be. So the idea here is that there were deviations from the orbit you would expect based on the known bodies in the system, and that allows you to infer the presence of other planets, um, and also to characterize those other planets. And so that's basically what we're doing with the Kepler planets. Um, it's a technique called, it's making use of what are called transit time variation. Um, the idea is that if you have just a single planet and a star, and a star the motion is Keplerian, so the transits occur exactly periodically. Um, but if you have other planets in the system, then there's gravitational interactions between the planets, and so sometimes the transits come a bit early, and sometimes they come a bit late compared to what you'd expect for a Keplerian orbit. And so what you get is something that looks like this. So, um, so these are different subsequent transits, of a so the y-axis is just different transits in time, and what it's plotting is the brightness of the star in time, and so you can see the transits are occurring, and that's what the dips are. Um, on the x-axis, though, is the, um, basically the timing of the transit. So if all the transits were occurring exactly periodically, they all line up on that blue vertical line. But you can see that they're shifted relative to that blue vertical line, and that's the sign that for this system, there's actually another planet in the system that's non-transiting. Um, and these authors, Ms. Warney et al., were able to uniquely characterize this non-transiting planet based just on its gravitational interactions with the transiting planet. So that's one thing you can do with transit time variations is detect new planets, um, but also you can, um, you know, the interactions between planets depend on the orbital properties of the transiting planet itself. So you can actually use this to characterize the planets that are transiting as well. And so that's the other, um, the other, uh, promising part of teaching these. 
And I think the best system to really highlight how much TTD is going to give you is Kepler 36. So Kepler 36 is a system with two transiting planets. Um, their orbital periods are 14 and 16 days. So that means that these planets are orbiting extremely close to each other. And so if you lived in a version of Seattle on Kepler 36b, the inner planet, and you looked out at the sky at closest approach, Kepler 36c would appear this large in the sky. And so just for comparison, that's how large the moon appears in our sky. Um, another way to get an idea of how close these planets are to each other is um, at closest approach, the distance between um, 36b and c is only five times the distance between the Earth and the moon. Um, but these planets are together have 10 times more mass than the Earth and the moon system. So that means that the gravitational interactions between these planets are extremely strong. And that leads to transit time variations, which are very unique looking, um, which I'll show you in a moment, and that's why this system is so well characterized. Um, and in fact, this system is the best constrained system on the planet, other than the solar system, uh, and perhaps the pulsar planets. And when I say best constrained, I mean we know the masses of these planets very precisely, we know their full three-dimensional orbits. We know the mutual inclination of these planets to better than two degrees, um, and that's just coming from their, their transits. So it's very powerful. Um, something that I worked on for this system was actually showing that with the very precise constraints we have uh, for these orbits, you can show that these orbits are chaotic. Um, so like the solar system, the orbits of the planets in this system are chaotic, but they're long-lived. So it's still, um, it's not like it's uh, showing instability on short time scales. Um, so here are the transit time variations for the system. Um, so I'm gonna be showing a plot similar, some plot similar to this later on. Um, so what the y-axis here is the deviation from a constant period orbit. Um, so up here, these planets are coming late. These transits are uh, several hours late. These ones are several hours early um, as a function of time for the two planets. And just as another indication of how strongly these planets are interacting, the TDD, the perturbation to the Keplerian motion, is on the order of 1%. So these are, yeah, the very strongly uh, interacting system. So that's the promise of transit time variations. Um, but despite this promise, out of something like 260 planets in the Kepler data set that show transit time variations, only a small fraction have been uh, actually analyzed in a detailed way. And so there's um, a few reasons for that. Um, the first is that this TTD inversion process of going from TTD data to parameter constraints on the planets, uh, that's a computationally intensive problem. Because the sort of simplest approach would just be to do every time you evaluate your model, you do an n-body integration, where you take your model parameters are initial positions, essentially, for the system. You can integrate forward in time, figure out the transit time volume compared to the data. And so that's computationally intensive. Um, furthermore, uh, there's strong degeneracies between parameters, um, and it's a high dimensional space. You have seven parameters per planet. Um, and so that makes the parameter inference part of the problem also very challenging. It takes a long time for things like Markov chains to converge. Um, another issue, um, whether or not you think this is an issue depends a little bit on maybe your philosophy. But for me, this is an issue because the n-body <coughs> integration is essentially a black box. You know, it is just gravity, and we understand gravity very well. There's nothing really complicated about the physics in some sense. But it's very unclear after you run this big modeling process, at the end of the day, you end up with mass constraints, for example, for your planets. And it's unclear exactly what part of the TTD signal gave you that mass constraint. Um, and I'd say this is especially true because of degeneracies between parameters. Um, for example, we know that there's a mass eccentricity of degeneracy, which I'm going to speak about in a second, um, yet we're still getting mass constraints. And so the question is, how are these coming, how are we actually getting this information from TTDs? Um, so that's what I'm going to start talking about first. Um, this degeneracy that arises for planets that are near what are called orbital period resonances or mean motion resonances. So um, a resonance in any physical system uh, occurs when you drive that system with a frequency that's commensurate with the natural frequency of the system. So for a planetary system, you can get resonances when the period ratio of the two planets forms a rational number. So we can imagine a system where, for example, the outer planet has twice the period of the inner planet, and the planets are starting um, at conjunction. So conjunctions when the planets line up radially from the star is when they're interacting most strongly in their orbits. <coughs> so because of the resonance, um, as the orbits evolve the time, you see the conjunctions are always happening at the same time, or at the same place. Um, and so what that means is that the perturbations of the planets apart on each other are basically going to add coherently in time and produce a larger effect. Um, more generally, uh, you can have a system that's near resonance, but not actually, so that system that I just showed was dynamically in the resonance, where the conjunctions are always happening at the same spot. But more generally, you can have something that's near resonance, 
So the period's off a little bit by amount epsilon from the exact period ratio. And then in that case, what happens is that the longitude of conjunctions where the planets meet, it circulates about the orbit. And it circulates by a small amount of each conjunction. So the time scale for circulation is much longer than the time, the orbital period of either of the planets. And so these, these resonances are important because I mentioned that's where um, the, the small gravitational interactions between planets that they impart every single conjunction where they add coherently and produce a larger effect. And so it's actually near resonances where TTVs are most observable. Um, so uh, several years ago, um, in 2012, um, people studied this case of two planets near one of these resonances. And what they showed was that the TTVs for these planets um, are going to be sinusoidal. The time scale for the sinusoid, so sorry, this is again TTVs, this is the deviation from constant period orbit as a function of time. Um, the time scale for this cycle, the sinusoid, is that time scale for circulation, right? So at, when that circulates all the way around and the pattern repeats. Um, so you have sinusoidal um, TTVs and they're also typically anti-correlated. So it's great that we have this formula and we have this understanding of it, um, but the, the problem is that you want to know if both planets mass are the same, both of their eccentricities. And if you have two anti-correlated sinusoids, where you can, back, you can back out what the period is just based on how close they are to the resonance, so you know that. Basically, your only observables are the two amplitudes and one phase, because once you know one phase, you know the other phase, because they're anti-correlated. So that's only three observables, and that's not enough to concern the masses and the eccentricities. So there's this fundamental degeneracy that arises. Um, so the work that I did then was to try and understand how you get mass measurements uh, in this case. And so what uh, Eric Aiko and I uh, looked at was basically, um, instead of studying you know, this slow variation where you have small perturbations that accumulate, you actually go back to those conjunction to conjunction transit time variations. So the small kicks that don't add coherently, but they still occur every single uh, time the planets meet. And so that's what you can see actually, so this is the data for that same system in black. And the blue is a range of n-body solutions to it. Um, what you can see is that there's this, these short period variations. Those aren't noise, right? The air bars are smaller than, they're very small. And so this, these deviations are bigger than the noise. Um, we call that chopping. Um, and the basic idea then is that you know, the transit time variations for a planet um, they have these resonant components where you can have these indices. But there's also the short period chopping, uh, which is this conjunction to conjunction TCB. And that depends on the parameters in a different way. Um, and so you can use it to break degeneracies. Um, and in fact, as I'm going to show, um, these short period TTVs gives the mass uniquely um, without any eccentricity contribution. <coughs> so I'm just going to sketch now how we derive this formula. Um, and um, yeah, it's just a sketch of it. If you have questions, um, if you're interested in the details, please ask me. Um, the basic idea is that um, TTVs are deviations from a constant period, sort of background average orbit, right? And that background orbit is not necessarily the unperturbed orbit. It's not that you would get if you removed the perturbing planet. It's just some background average orbit after the interactions are averaged out. And so we consider the case where you have circular orbits, so the simplest or nearly circular orbits. So in that case, you only have 10 major axes for each of the planets and what's called the mean longitude, which tells you where the planet is in its orbit. So we approach this problem using uh, Hamiltonian mechanics. So we're talking about canonical variables, canonical momenta and coordinates. Um, and it turns out that the same major axes um, are related to the canonical momentum. And these mean longitude, where the planet is in its orbit, that's related to the, the uh, conjugate uh, variable to the momentum. So we write down the Hamiltonian for the system, which you can use then to derive the equation for motion. Um, and it consists of a Keplerian part, <coughs> which only depends on the same major axis. Um, and then also this interaction piece, which takes roughly this form, right? It's linear in the mass of the perturbing planet to the mass of the star, um, and it has all these different harmonics, uh, and it only depends on psi, which is the angle between the two planets, which is what you'd expect in the nearly circular limit when there's no preferential, there's no preferred direction, right? There's no peri-centers that's pointing somewhere. So the only angle that matters is actually just the angle between the two planets. So what we do then is we derive a canonical transformation um, to a new set of variables where the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian takes this form. Um, and actually you can show that this is equivalent to averaging over these interactions. So what that means is that uh, in these new variables, the motion describes the background or average orbit, right? And in the real variables, you have all the interactions between the planets. 
so the transformation between the two is exactly what you need to drive TTDs, because TTDs are the, the perturbations to an average orbit that arise from interaction. Um, so that's, that's basically the, the method that we use. So we applied this um, to a system with two planets with masses m1 and m2 and a semi-major axis ratio alpha. Um, and this is the, the formula for the TTDs that we find due to these conjunction to conjunction effects. So uh, I first want to point out that it only depends on the angle between the two planets, um, which is what we would expect. There's these amplitude coefficients for the different um, contributions to these TTDs. Those only depend on the same major axis ratio. Um, and then there is scaling, so the TTDs are generally larger if the orbital period is larger and if you have a larger perturbing planet. Um, so what's interesting though is that you can see that if you measure these short period TTDs, right, you know what the period of the transiting planet is, uh, you know what the period of the perturbing planet is, and that means you also know what their semi major axis ratio is, and you know how the angle between them evolves in time. So the only unknown on the right hand side is often the planetary mass ratio for the perturbing planet. And so that shows you very directly that if you measure these short period chopping TTDs, you learn about the masses of the perturbing planets. Um, so when you have a system that's near resonance, you can combine this with the resonant TTD for that large amplitude sinusoid um, and break the degeneracy between mass and eccentricity. So I'm just going to show you now sort of um, pictorially or but with real uh, data essentially how that happens. So here, this is Planet Hunters 3. This is that same system of TTDs that I showed you before. Um, and what I'm showing this is the mass of the outer planet and our masses and the mass of the inner planet. Um, and what I'm showing is the confidence contour you get if you fit the, the timing of the data for the system. And so this red contour is what you get if you just fit the sinusoidal component. So the, the, the component that arises because the system is near a resonance. And what you see is that there's a, a degeneracy between the two masses, and that's because each mass is correlated with eccentricity. And so when you plot them versus each other, you see that, um, that they have this correlation. Now, if you just fit the short period TTDs of the inner planet, you learn about the mass of the outer planet, and then this is the constraint you get on the mass of the outer planet. Um, if you combine the two formulae and you fit the data together, you get this, this ellipse here, right? So you can see that the short period TCD has broken the degeneracy between the masses. Um, and so what's especially cool is that if you fit this data with an n-body integrator, so that's taking into account all of the interactions between the planets, there's no approximations, you get this blue air ellipse here. And so what this is telling you is that it's basically telling you that the information the TTVs is coming from the resonant piece and the short period interactions, and then it's the short period interactions that really give you the mass. So I think this is really nice because analytic formulae then is they're telling you what information in the TTV is giving you what parameter uh, estimates. So probably that the resonant, if you just use the resonant formula, yeah. and that feels like you can get the wrong answer. Uh, yeah. So that's so, because. So um, this is the thing, right? So for this particular, so. Um, this like lithic et al. formula that we're using for the resonant TTD makes approximations that break down as you move away from resonance. So, yeah, so it's an approximate formula, and for this system, it has some error. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think the error would be uh, biased in a particular way. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mentioned earlier the uh, challenges with TTD analyses, um, and the first one was the TTD inversion and computational expenses. So for example, it can take weeks to months to analyze a particular system with a standard n-body integrator. Um, even with very optimized integrations for this training time analysis, such as TTD fast, it can still take days to weeks. Um, but if you use a code based on analytic formulae, um, it can take 10 minutes to days. So all of a sudden this opens up the possibility of really doing a complete um, uh, analysis of all the systems with Kepler that show TTDs. And I'll just point out that um, Eric and I also the list of all formula so we can get rid of that error. Um, and all of these, um, I, I guess there's not people here that work on planets, but um, all of this code is available on GitHub so the community can use it to analyze timing data as well. Um, the other challenge that I presented was you know, this question of how TDD analyses actually work. Um, and I think that um, the work that we've done shows that it's really the conjunction of conjunction TTD that constrains masses, whereas it's that long period resonant TTD that is going to give you eccentricity information. So I just want to show you now a few results that are coming from TTD analysis, um, just to show you some of the exciting things that come when you can measure masses and radii for planets. So this is a, a mass radius diagram for small planets. So the mass is the Earth masses, the radius is the Earth radii. 
Um, the black are data points that have come from our view, the RV work that I mentioned earlier. Um, and basically there's no error bars in the, the X direction because the radius is known very well, but the errors on the maps are much bigger. And so in orange then I'm showing a selection, um, not a bias selection, but just a smaller subset of the TTB, uh, the planets that have TTB masses measured from TTBs. Um, and so what you can see is that at a given radius, TTBs are sensitive to planets with smaller masses. So these low density, so small mass planets at a particular radius are low density. These low density planets are completely inaccessible to RVs, but their presence is actually extremely exciting from a formation point of view, because these planets you can show are so low density that they need to have a substantial um, atmosphere, basically made of uh, hydrogen and helium, uh, to explain their low density given their mass. Um, and how these planets could have acquired such a large atmosphere um, yeah, as I'll mention later on, um, ties into where they and how they could have formed. Um, this approach of using analytic formulae to, to constrain masses and eccentricities is being used now um, for hundreds more planets, for example, by Sam Haddon and Norm Lithwick. Um, and also, uh, I'm involved with um, some people at Caltech that are using K2, um, which is the sort of Kepler 2 mission, that repurposed Kepler to uh, find planets now on brighter stars where RV is possible. Um, I'm involved in work to look at how, what the constraints you can get when you um, combine TTD and RV analyses for the same system. Um, but yeah, so, so there's not that many points on this right now, um, but there's going to be a lot more in the future. So yeah, there's I think a lot of good stuff coming. Um, so the trend, you're not, the selection types, you aren't people using or any sort of selection biases that you have? So, okay, yeah, so there's definitely selection bias, right? Because RVs, the way you get a bigger RV signal is basically by boosting the planet mass. And you can get a bigger TTB signal by um, boosting the planet mass or by pushing pairs of planets closer to resonance or changing the eccentricities. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that the RV method is much more sensitive or biased towards high mass planets than TTBs are. Um, TTBs are also, that method is biased towards larger planets at a given mass because if you have a bigger radius, you have a clearer transit. So you get more precise to measure transit times. Um, so there's definitely observational biases, um, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there are these very low density planets, um, which just their their existence is interesting. Should sure, I just because it looks like a trend? I mean, um, just that they're always low. Oh yeah, so that <laughs> yeah okay. So I think the diagonal line, like yeah. Um, so is that R cubed? I think it's. I have to think. I think it's R cubed up to a certain size, and then it kind of changes like, when the atmosphere starts to play a role. You mean the, the gray line is R cubed? That's what it is. Like if you fit, I think it's like R cubed up to about here, and then it looks like there's a transition to the, okay. to the data. So that's actually in this like Weiss and Larson paper. Um, there, they talk about a transition that happens at about one place of Earth, where you, uh, where you go from being primarily rocky to having a substantial atmosphere. Does that answer you? Yeah. Um, I also, I should have mentioned it, it's kind of hard to see, but Kepler 36, that system that I mentioned before, the data points are here and here. Um, so they're still, yeah, among, well, as I, I said, they're basically the best measure masses for small planets, and those are coming from TTPs. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch. Do you have uh, yeah. any planet that's measured with both methods? Yes. Oh. So um, not that many, um, but there's something, I think there's six planets that have been measured with massive measures for both methods, and five of them agree. Well, it doesn't. I had a student over the summer working on that one, um, and we haven't figured it out yet. But for the most part, they do agree with each other. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, so in the second part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about how planets interact with disks, um, and basically asking the question: Do we think interaction with the protoplanetary disk uh, has affected the Kepler population? So planet disk interactions are very natural. So theoretically, they, they should arise, right? Because as a planet um, is moving through the leftover gaseous disk, uh, it excites, like a boat, it excites a wake in that disk. So, so you have waves coming off the planet. But unlike the boat, the material that's closer in towards the star is moving more quickly than the planet, and the material that's moving, uh, that's exterior to the planet is moving less quickly. And so this wake actually will get sheared out into a spiral density wave. And so these over densities of material, um, uh, those represent sort of, you can think of small bodies a little bit, and they can exert a gravitational torque on the planet, 
which leads to um, a net loss of angular momentum. So you have the planet migrate in towards the star, um, and also the eccentricity of the planet will be damped through these interactions. So when people ask, so people like me, when we study this, um, I want to study, I guess, the actual hydrodynamic simulations are very time consuming and they're very hard. Um, and I want to know, as I'm going to talk about in a second, how these interactions change the interactions between planets when you have more than one planet in the system. Um, and it's very hard to study that all together because the hydro takes a long time to do every single orbit, whereas the interactions between planets typically take place over you know, millions of orbits or something like that. And so it's actually extremely hard to do hydrodynamical simulations coupled with the in body integrations of the planet for the long enough for a long enough amount of time to actually study the effects that I'm going to talk about. And so what we do is actually we take results from hydro and we parameterize them to use in the end body integration. And typically people have just taken a simple exponential. So they say that the semi axis is damped on a very long time scale, and so we're just going to say it's exponential with some characteristic time scale. And the same thing is true for the eccentricities. And that's sort of the simplest prescription that you can take for the effects of interactions with like this. Okay, but but basically, these planet kind of disk interactions are natural, and they should lead to migration and also eccentricity damping. Um, and that's a theoretical key motivation for studying them, is because they should just they should happen. Um, observationally, we also have some evidence that they play a role, um, just simply from the gross feature that the Kepler systems have so much mass of planets very close to their host star. So we can take a system like Kepler-11, which has five planets, there are six planets, five of which lie interior to the orbit of Mercury, and we can count up the mass in the planets. Um, these system, this system has masses measured through TTPs. And if you do that, you find that Kepler-11 has something like 22 Earth masses of material in planets in um, an orbital separation of 0.25 AU. And in comparison, the solar system only has two Earth masses of material in planets in a distance of six, time, six times that big. And so the question is, why are these planets so close to their star? Um, is it possible that they formed further out and then migrated in towards their host star? Um, and so if you want to test that hypothesis, the natural thing to do then is to look at migration and just try and find some testable prediction to then look and see if it's present in the data. Um, and actually, one of the clearest predictions of migration um, is a feature that appears for multi-planet systems. So we're going to be, what I'm going to be discussing for the remainder of the talk is essentially the outcome of convergent migration of systems with two planets. So it's convergent because, for example, the outer planet is migrating more quickly and it catches up to the inner planet. Um, and so to understand the outcome of this, we can actually again take inspiration from our own solar system and think about the outcome of convergent migration of three moons, for example, three of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. So Ganymede, Io, and Europa are locked in what's called the Laplace resonance. So they're locked in these orbital period resonances, where the period ratio of the three moons is a period ratio of four to two to one. Um, and it was shown in the 60s that this uh, is the result, or is consistent with being the result of convergent migration, but where the migration is due to tidal interactions with Jupiter. And so the difference for what we're talking about is that the migration is due to interaction with the gas disk. So um, this idea of convergent migration producing bodies in resonance um, has been applied to planets before. Um, so Lee and Peel in 2002 used it to try and explain GJ876. Um, so this was a simulation, I'll explain the plot first. So the semi-major axes A and eccentricity evolution of two planets converging. So, so as a function of time, the outer planet's catching up with the inner planet. At this point, they actually reach the two to one mean motion resonance, and then they start migrating together. And they start migrating together because at that point they're captured into the two to one resonance, and subsequent evolution preserves that period ratio. Um, what you can see is that the eccentricities are also excited by that, but they quickly go to this equilibrium value. So um, the language I'm going to use later is that the system is quickly driven to a fixed point at the center of the resonance, and that fixed point is stable. Um, this was an uh, interesting idea because there are gas giants that are found in or near resonances. This is coming from radio velocity work. And you know, resonances, if you think about it, the period ratio between two planets just being some number along the real line, if you just throw a dart at the real line, you're never going to land near a resonance. Um, so there's some sort of, there needs to be some sort of explanation for why we should be this preferentially near resonances for the gas giant. And so convergent migration is a nice idea because it predicts 
um, in the simplest picture, at least based on this exponential damping, um, permanent capture into resonance. Okay, so then this is this clear prediction. We can look at the Kepler data and ask, are the Kepler planet pairs near resonance? Um, here is the period ratio distribution for the Kepler sample. So this is the number of adjacent pairs found at a particular period ratio, where the period ratio is always between adjacent planets in the same system. Um, and so what you can see here, these dashed lines are the locations of the major mean motion resonances or orbital period resonances. And you can see that there's no preference for immeasurability at all. Um, basically, any period ratio is, um, you know, in this range at least, is, is equally likely. Um, so the question then is, does this lack of commensurability explain, does that indicate that migration didn't happen, and therefore that these planets must have formed essentially where we see them today, very close to their host star? Um, and this has been sort of a question of debate over the past few years of whether or not in-situ formation happened or whether or not these planets migrated. So the work that I did now with Constantine was to basically reassess this sort of classic picture of convergent migration and to actually ask, is this the whole story? Um, do you always get capture into resonance? Is it always permanent or can it be temporary? So sort of in mathematical terms, what we were asking was under what conditions is the fixed point at the center of resonance that this system is being driven to? Under what conditions is that actually a stable fixed point? Um, so to do this sort of analysis, what you need to do is like first just outline your equations of motion. So our first ingredient um, to describe the system is just conservative dynamics, so dynamics that conserves energy um, for two planets near the motion resonance. Right, that's sort of the end body stuff. And then we also add in a dissipative prescription for how interaction with the disk or changes in the axis and eccentricity. So the prescription that we adopt is slightly more complicated than the one we used before because there's this term here that links the semi axis evolution to the uh, eccentricity evolution. Um, this is more accurate than the simple exponential damping of semi axis. Um, it agrees with hydrodynamic simulations for low eccentricities. And so I think what probably happened in the past was that this term, you can say, well, eccentricity is damped, so the eccentricity is really small, and this is E squared, right? So we don't need to worry about that. But the issue is that actually the time scale for eccentricity damping is shorter than that percentage of axis damping, and so you have a small number divided by a small number, and so this term isn't necessarily negligible. Um, so we, we keep this term in our analysis. And um, I just want to be completely upfront that we were very inspired to do this by uh, Peter Goldreich and Thomas Schlichting, who studied essentially this, the same problem, but in the context of the circular restrictive free body problem. We have a planet and a test particle. The planet's on a circular orbit, and you study the evolution of that system undergoing migration. Um, so what they showed was that actually in that case, you can get temporary capture the resonance, which we found really exciting. But the problem was that they looked at it for this restricted case where one planet's a test particle. And when you're talking about the Kepler systems, you have a lot of systems where the planets have essentially the same mass. And so it's unclear if these same results would happen when you actually study the more realistic um, case. So um, as I mentioned, we did a stability analysis then of essentially the, the resonant fixed point. Um, there's three dynamic degrees of freedom for the problem. Um, there's a number that we, or a variable that depends on the eccentricities of the planets. There's the period ratio of the two planets. And there's something that tells you about where conjunctions happen. Um, which we call the resonant angle. Uh, the first thing to do is to solve where the fixed point is. That's where the time derivative of all these parameters is zero. And that basically is the center of resonance. And then you study how small perturbations that grow or decay in time. Um, so just, yeah, just kind of the usual linear stability analysis you do. Um, we found that one of the eigenvalues is real and negative. So that always corresponds to a stable or contracting direction. Um, and then there's a complex conjugate pair. And so, for example, if you say the system is damped towards that fixed point through, so it's captured into resonance, but you want to know if that capture is permanent. So then you can say, well, we make some small perturbation, for example, with the eccentricity or the period ratio, and study how that grows. And so what this analysis shows is that you're going to have one part that's always contracting, so that's a stable, corresponds to stable motion. And then there's a, the motion corresponding to the complex conjugate pair which corresponds to oscillatory motion that's coming from the imaginary part. And then this oscillatory motion um, either has a growing or decaying uh, amplitude depending on whether or not this is positive or negative. Okay, 
So, so in the first case, where the, the real part is negative, you get permanent capturing to residence, because then all of the real parts of the eigenvalues are um, negative, and that corresponds to just contracting towards the fixed point. So any small perturbation quickly decays. So just a sort of a sketch or a cartoon of what would be going on was that, you know, because you have these three different degrees of freedom, you have three different di directions in which you can move. And for example, if this is the eigen direction associated with alpha zero, you have contracting motion there, and then you have a stable spiral with a decaying amplitude in the plane of the other two eigenvectors. And essentially that's exactly to some extent what was seen before, or the motions or a fixed point stable to get permanent capture in presence. Um, but if the real part of this um, set of eigenvalues is uh, positive, then you have an unstable spiral. So what you get is actually, you get you still get contraction towards the fixed point, but then you get um, oscillations about the fixed point that are growing the amplitude, and eventually you break out of the resonance. Um, and that is what we saw in our own work. So this is showing the case we have a more massive planet exterior to the inner planet, and it's migrating inwards. And so what you can see is that the period ratio is a little bit hard to see here at the two to one, but here they're migrating towards each other. They encounter the three to two resonance with the period ratio of 1.5. And they're captured into resonance because then their period ratio stays constant for some amount of time. Um, similarly, as before, you see that the eccentricity grows up to some equilibrium value, uh, which is the stash line, which is what we predicted analytically. Um, but then you see that there's oscillations about that, and the amplitude of oscillations is growing with time. And so that's because of that complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues having a positive real part. And then the pair breaks out of the 3 to 2 resonance, they keep migrating closer together until they get to the 4 to 3, the same thing happens, and so on. So potentially this is really exciting because it tells you that capture into resonance isn't permanent, and so, so potentially this sort of saves migration because you could have pairs migrating, you could have some resonance temporarily, and then they break out of resonance. And as long as they spend more time out of resonance than in resonance, you can reproduce the period ratio, or you might be able to reproduce the period ratio that we've observed where you don't have planets near resonance. Um, okay, yeah. Okay, so what we found though is that capture is possible, <coughs> so converged migration does put planets in resonance. If the eccentricity of the amplitude time scales for the two planets satisfies this criterion, where M1 and M2 are the masses of the two planets. So, however, though, the, the time scale for damping scales inversely with the planet mass. And so if you just plug that in, what you find is that the resonance is going to be stable. So you're going to get permanent capture if the outer planet is less massive than the inner planet. And so um, the first thing to realize then is that fundamentally this means you cannot, in this case, use a restricted problem where one of the planets is a test particle because you have this interesting mass dependence. So that means you have to do the full analysis that we did. Um, okay, yeah. Um, and so one particularly strange consequence of that, which I still haven't actually really understood theoretically, is that, you know, I showed you this example before, we have a massive planet migrating in towards a small thing. And then you get this effect of break out of resonance. But in the opposite case, where you have um, a test particle essentially moving in towards a massive planet, you just get permanent capture into resonance. So these are four different simulations showing basically a planet appearing to be capturing the 2 resonance, the eccentricity goes up to a equal in value, and it just stays there. And the same thing is true for these other resonance as well. So there's a sort the mass asymmetry is really sort of strange. Um, the other thing that we found um, numerically was that pairs actually spent more time escaping resonance, but trapped in a resonance of some kind compared to migrating in between them. Um, and that's shown here for now comparable mass planets. Um, you can see that most of the time is spent in a resonance. Um, this is also seen numerically in other people's simulations. And so essentially then what we've shown is that either capture is permanent, depending on the mass ratio, or else it's temporary, but you still have a population spending most of the time in resonance. And so if you imagine then that this process is happening for a number for a population of pairs, and at some point the gas just goes away, you're going to be left with a population that's preferentially in a resonance of some kind. And so it still appears like migration uh, isn't consistent with temper data. Right? Because as we saw before, most of the pairs aren't in a near a resonance. You say is or isn't, I'm sorry. Is not. Is not. Yeah, because most, most pairs are not near resonance. Um, so then can we say that this lack of commensurability implies that these planets didn't migrate, that they must have formed more or less where we see them, 
that was more complicated. Um, because people have shown, for example, that effects that we haven't included, like turbulence, can break planets out of residence, which is sort of intuitive, right? Turbulence, you can think of as just a party small way that kicks to the planets. And if those kicks are big enough or if they accumulate, um, you can knock the pair out of the residence. Um, and indeed, actually, um, so I mentioned before that it's really hard to do these hydrodynamical simulations with the end body integrations for the amount of time that you need to study these sorts of things. Um, this one study this group did, their simulations took um, three to nine months to run. So there's still a lot of room or benefit to doing the analytic work. Um, but they also pointed to turbulence as the explanation for possibly why the Kepler pairs aren't found in residence. Um, also, we can't actually get away with ignoring migration because some of the Kepler planets are very, very low density, right? That was something that came from TCD work. And that means that they have a large atmosphere um, and they had to accrete that atmosphere when the gas was there, which means that they were embedded in the gas disk. Um, they couldn't have formed after the disk went away. And so if they were accreting gas from the disk and they were also interacting with the gas disk, and so these planet pairs that have very low densities um, must have migrated to some extent. So we still need to, yeah, so there's still, um, it's an ongoing thing. Okay, so um, I now want to just uh, finish by summarizing. Um, I say one of the main takeaways is that you know exoplanet systems are extremely common and they're very diverse. Um, solar system that doesn't have these short periods while planets really found in abundance by Kepler might be relatively uncommon. Well, although I think that um, it's maybe more interesting or more attractive to think of the solar system is just lying on the edge of this distribution that Kepler didn't quite get to. And there's some. It could still be that that's the case instead of the solar system being odd for not having these small planets, that it's just in a region that Kepler didn't really probe. Um, if you want to understand the formation of these small planets, um, and in particular, or in just in general, I guess, understand this diversity that we see, you need to first characterize the planets um, and have a well-characterized population. And so I talked about how trans-time variation, which are um, these interactions that take advantage of the dynamics on short time scales, um, those are really what's used, been useful for the Kepler system and for characterizing them. Um, and then the next step, once you have a well-characterized population, um, is to determine what dynamical processes actually act after formation, which might uh, explain this diversity. And so I talked about how um, we're trying to assess still whether or not interaction with the disk is important for the Kepler uh, planets, um, to try and figure out whether or not they formed in situ from, say, more massive disks than we expect for the solar system, um, or if they form further out in just like the solar system, but for some reason migrated in. Um, and finally, I just want to bring it back home. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to think about how the solar system fits into all of this. Um, and uh, although it might not look um, qualitatively like some of the systems that we've seen and like the majority of systems that we've seen, um, we can identify similarities, at least in the processes that are important for explaining the solar system and for explaining the exoplanets. So I talked a lot about um, you know, migration and capture into resonance. Um, and that is a process that we think happened in the solar system. So early on in the solar system, these four planets were locked in a chain and made motion resonances that was established through interaction with the gas disk. Um, and so even though the solar system might not look like the Kepler planets, um, it would be sort of attractive or sort of cool if the same dynamical processes were um, also important for these exoplanet systems. So uh, I'll end there. Thank you. So you're, so if I understood your result right, then uh, you know the figure that you show of the uh, of the plants that don't show that they're stacking up at residences, it seemed that you had a fairly secure prediction that if you divided instead of just dividing them all together, yeah. you sort of took them apart and said, well, here are the ones where the inner planet is more massive than the outer planet. That histogram should look somewhat different yeah. than the ones where that's reversed. Is that? So, um, does it? <laughs> uh, well, it's a great thing to look at. The um, problem is these, we only have their sizes because they're transient planets, so we need massive. And actually, um, as I showed you before, you, know, you could think like, well, if they're bigger, maybe they're more massive. But what we saw from TTVs and from RV work is that at a particular radius, you have a wide range of masses. But, um, I mean, so but, but you must know, uh, yeah, I think there were 60 pairs or something. Or maybe it's not pairs, maybe that's the problem. So how many? systems are there of two planets where you know both masses? 
Um, yeah, so I think that's probably about right. It's on the order of the figures. Yeah. Um, so one thing though is that it's tricky. So um, most of those are actually near residents. Um, so that would be a good. You could ask though if they're near residents, but they don't satisfy this match ratio thing. Is that, is that consistent? Um, I haven't actually looked this up. Um, but I would say, at least in terms of the conclusion about say migration, um, there's still issues with migration. It's going to happen because that. So that still stands because that migration does produce residents. That'd be a very naive question. I'm trying to decide if what differences you might expect to cause in why some systems show these interactions with the disk or not. Are there any correlation with spectral type or the parent star? I mean, I'm um, trying to decide something that would affect the initial conditions of the disk in which the planets form and the resonance that's going to occur. So, yeah, so um, I think that there's learned so far about correlations with stellar type. So it's mainly, Kepler really was mainly at F2 and K stars, because we're looking for stuff that's unlike stars. Um, and for there, the occurrence rate, I think, is comparable um, among those three types of stars, although I think going towards lower mass stars, the occurrence rate goes up. And then it's really for M dwarfs that it's actually a lot higher. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that um, a clue so at all, or is that my target the wrong tree? Is, is that a clue at all? Oh, um, I mean, it's definitely a clue that something's different with M-dwarfs um, compared to, or it shows something's different. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think people have looked at, say, like the fraction of pairs in the resonance as a bunch of stellar type, um, but my guess would be that it'd be pretty fun to undertake yeah. Um, just because, because there's actually not that many pairs here, um, and then especially around M-dwarfs, because Kepler's in target M-dwarfs, there's even fewer pairs. Right. But, but yeah, trying to think about how stellar type affects planet formation is definitely something people are starting to think about. Well, it was just whether the differences in the initial conditions or the types of disks. That was right, type of, yeah. types of disks. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think actually one thing that could be at play is that um, lower mass stars actually have a lower occurrence rate of giant planets. Yeah. Um, so that could be something interesting. Like maybe there's something related to the presence of giant planets. But, um, you know, affects the dynamics of smaller planets also. Mm -hmm. That's something that I'll ask one thing also. So possibly related to that question. So the minimum mass solar nebula you had for the Kepler 11? Uh, it was like an order of magnitude larger than the actual minimum mass solar nebula. Yeah, so that's some, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, so th yeah. this goes into the hydro somewhere, right? The gas and the dust. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I, I mean, this is, a, this, this is, I mean, what that value is, you start with, I mean, the hydro very Yeah, so I think that, like, for example, the, uh, the in simulations that I mentioned, like, the main thing that we're taking away from is what the time scale is, okay. or the migration, or from the X and the speed jumping, and the, the disk density shows up in that. Okay. So, yeah. But that, but that must be some, almost totally like these kind of three parameters. Yeah, basically, yeah, 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 yeah. So the only thing that we were really keeping yeah, and so, but as you pointed out, so there's there's this difference in surface densities that you need to produce the Kepler planets if they form or receive them today compared with the solar system. Um, and so that's one of, so if these planets formed in situ, then they needed much more mass than disks compared to our solar system probably. Um, and so then there's still something to try and understand there about why. So, so at some point, much of it starts to evolve or at least cross over into some Start how stars actually form. Yeah, I know what effects it is. Yeah. Right, like, you know, angular momentum in the. Magnetic fields. It's all magnetic fields. Magic. Magnetic magnetic fields. Fields. No, I think they're, they're cool magnetic fields. Hydro. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, do you have a question? Observationally, what's the way forward? Is it Plato or. Um, you mean for To so fill in that, you know, how we at the tip of the iceberg in terms of hydro. Actually, I was going to ask on tests. I guess that's oh. a good question. Uh, yeah, so just filling this, yeah. like the planet mass versus separation plot. Sure. Um, so, so Tess and um, also Plato uh, are their main advantage is finding small planets around bright stars. Um, so it's not necessarily that they're, they're not going to be longer periods of Kepler because I think even Plato has a baseline of two years or three years maybe. 
and then Tess has a baseline of one year except for, no, it's actually only 30 days per field, but at the field, at the polls, it's going to get more than 22. But yeah, so Tess and Plato are finding shorter period plan that's actually works on the shorter side of Kepler. Um, but the benefit is that they're on bright stars, so you can do radio velocity follow up and get masses for them that way. And then I think the, the goal is to use that bridging of these two toilets to atmospheric studies. Um, so that's definitely one big push for exoplanets is atmospheres, those small planets. And then I guess trying to use the atmospheric composition to try and understand something about formation. Um, I think something that's so Microlensing, I think, is actually the only way forward though for um, for small planets at distances of like one, two AU. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Just, I'd like to. I'm sorry to yeah. do this to you, but I'd like all the astronomy faculty to stay here for five minutes, uh, just so I can take the talk after the break. Well, she has to go to lunch anyway, so she she doesn't want to stay around. All right, so let's thank Catherine.